my screen, right? Yes. Okay. All right. So, yeah, like you mentioned, uh, Matthew 6, um, it talks about prayer. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet. <clears throat> and when thou hast shut the door, pray to the Father which is in secret. And thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. And then you go down to verse 8. Um, be not ye therefore like unto them that was talked about in verse 7. For your Father knows what things ye need of before ye mm -hmm. ask him. But so, just to break this down, um, you know, me praying for someone else is not something that I need. Um, if anything, it's something that they need, you know, and I just want want that for them, uh, you know, and that, there's a lot, honestly, you know, actually the more I think about it, we could, we could probably spend a whole hour talking about this because I do have a lot of questions and just, you know, thoughts about it. But so just, yeah, for that particular, what, what things you need of, I, that's something that I, I was thinking about this last night and that's something that I thought about, which could also stem into another question, but I don't want to derail it. But I was also thinking like, when you pray, do you speak or do you, can you pray internally? I'm sure God can hear your thoughts, but you know, one thing we've talked about is uh, on the subject of God being all knowing. And you mentioned something along the lines of you don't think it's necessary that He knows every little detail about everything. And I'm guessing that He has the power to know whatever He wants to know. But this, you said you made an example like what what kind of cheese I'm putting on my sandwich or something like that. Like He doesn't necessarily need to know that. Um. So I don't know. That's that's where my head goes. With in particular with that verse, that's what I was thinking about last night. Is I know that like that exact verse came to mind. Your father knows what things you need before you ask him. But then, a the question, you know, do I need to voice my prayers out loud? And b, how does that apply to praying for someone else? Yeah. Um, so, you know, do you have to actually? vocalize your prayer um i would say no um but uh, you know i do anyway um I, typically i guess probably not all the time i don't really even think about it but right um for me just personally i got this prayer memorized right thy um Right. Our Father, which art in know. heaven, hallowed be thy name. So, uh, really, a lot of times I just keep it as simple as what's written here. Um, mm -hmm. Because of, uh, you know, circumstances outside of my control, um, I can't control those things outside of myself, right? And so, rather than adding things outside of this prayer I keep everything inside what is written and um, and try to gain peace and comfort uh, from that and then of course there's another verse uh, in Luke uh, oh, I forget in your patience possess ye your soul so whenever I'm having trouble those are like two of my go-to's and so um, I don't find it necessary to add to this prayer but um, for example if I feel like uh, somebody's doing me wrong um, there's two things in this prayer that or that I keep mindful and that is forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors and uh, lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil because when there's you know troublous times sometimes uh, there's that temptation to repay evil with evil you know what I mean and, yeah. and I don't know if that really applies to what you're asking about but um, 
those are the two things that I keep in mind because, you know, for me, uh, being able to forgive others has been a real challenge for me. And then, of course, um, I got to remember to forgive myself as well, right? Right. And, and I've, I've had similar struggles, but, uh, yeah, I guess that's that's really where my where my question is, is pray, praying for someone else, praying for someone that you care about, a family member or whatever. Um, you know, I mean, have you ever prayed that someone is saved? Well, um, I don't know that I have. I, I pray for peace, for others to have peace, because it's quite clear that, you know, there's a lot of people that uh, internally they are, you know, a void of peace, I guess, that they are they don't have peace, and that, that if they had peace in their heart, they wouldn't have as much trouble right. in their life, yeah. And there's only one real way to get that peace, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so what about, uh, um, oh, computer made a noise, I completely, it completely derailed my thought. Yeah, so as far as, I mean, you could pray for somebody else to have peace, uh, but really oh. it's going to be on them, right? Yeah. You can't control it. So you can't cast a spell like a magic potion, throw it in the air, and have that person receive peace. They. So is. Yeah. Yeah. So, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. I was gonna say like, is it, it? I don't know. I guess I, I know I'm like kind of being nitpicky here, but I'm trying to figure out like, is there? Is there any point to praying anything outside of the Lord's prayer? Or is it just vanity? Um, oh no no no! I I don't I don't believe that. I I think um, you you pray for whatever your heart desires. So right. of course, if you want somebody else to have peace, you pray it. And, yeah. And not just so that they might have peace, but so that you yourself will have peace. True. True. Um, and then another thing that I, like has been on my mind about this and. I mean, I'm guessing this is something where everybody kind of does it maybe a little bit differently, and maybe there's no right or wrong way to do it to an extent, um, but maybe that's wrong. I mean, I, I, I feel like I never hear people talk about this, and it, ironically, it does say, you know, um, uh, enter into your closet and pray in secret, and your Father will reward you openly, uh, so maybe we don't necessarily need to talk about it, but just for the sake of me not really knowing and wanting to wanting to have fruitful prayer uh, I feel like it's good to talk about it in that sense but because um, I've heard a lot of people say a lot of different things so for example like uh, and I'm talking like outside of the Lord's Prayer you know asking for something or whatever it is people people say that uh, you know that you should present yourself I don't want to say professionally, but like show some, I guess like I've, I've heard somebody say like to show, it, it's more respectful if you're not, you know, for, say, for example, sitting on a toilet while you pray or, or whatever, right? Like, or, you know, or, I, I don't know. And, and it's like, does that, but then there's also like the question, does it even matter? I mean, could I be laying in bed, you know, laying on my side, praying silently in my thoughts, or do I need to, you know, sit up, maybe get on my on my knees put my hands together speak out loud like there's so much gray area there between <laughs> all the different ways that you could pray let, let, not only just that physically but then also how you're asking for it do you, can, can it be like a conversation you know can you just say casually you know i'm not gonna sit here and say dude obviously like but you know can, can you speak somewhat casually do you like, you know what i mean like these are all kind of questions that I, that I kind of have, and maybe not super important in some of that, but I'm sure a lot of other people wonder the same thing. Yeah, no, For I, I, in my opinion, there's not a wrong way to pray. 
Um, mm -hmm. What Jesus gives us here is um, a simple guideline for how to pray. Mm -hmm. um, right, right. This is, you know, this is not like a law. You have to pray like this. There's no rule that says you have to put your hands together, and get on your knees. Right. Um, right. Uh, you know. No, that's like what the Muslims do. I think they they like basically lay on the floor and say some kind of yeah, you know, gibberish. They, uh, <laughs> they got to be pointed toward the east or something. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. And that doesn't. And yeah, matter. it's true. The Bible doesn't say that. So, so I guess that kind of begs the question. Like you know, and like you said, there's not just the wrong way to do it in that sense. Um, I don't know. I just want. When I have something that I feel very, very passionately in my heart that I want, usually for someone else, I mean, I don't, I, I don't really pray for myself beyond the Lord's Prayer. I don't really feel like I have a reason to, right? But other people that I care about that are clearly not saved, I care a lot about them, and I want, I, you know, I, I don't, I don't know if it's they need to accept God or. God has to open their eyes, or both. I don't know, but I'll pray. For, I'll pray for that for people that I care about, and I want to make sure that I have. That I'm not doing anything wrong, you know. No, yeah. I, if you were doing something wrong, I think you would be fully uh, convinced of it. Um, yeah. So that I don't, you know, again, I, I don't think you're doing. So it. I don't believe there's a wrong way to do it. Uh, now you think about this person that you care an awful lot for, um, and you want them to have peace, and you want them to come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, of course you want that, but um, don't you think God wants that even more for them? <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah, and... Yeah, so, I mean, keep that in mind. You want them to have peace. Well, God wants them to have peace, too. That's why Jesus came and right. laid, laid down his life and, and and gave his life for us that we might have peace mm -hmm. through him. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, God is not ignorant of of, of what's going on uh, around us. And, yeah, uh, I, um, I... This is a bit off topic, but I felt very... Uh, I felt a very powerful calling lately towards, um, I guess you'd call it evangelism. I, I don't really know, to be honest. Uh, just just preach, preaching the word, uh, but not necessarily like helping people that are asking for help. I, I told you about that conversation I had with somebody the other day, and I don't even know, truthfully, if it was fruitful, but just seeing them change the way that they were saying things uh, felt good. And then, and then, actually, I think it was that same night, later that night, someone else and that same community re reached out and um, just said something along the lines of they, they're trying to improve their spirituality. They don't feel a connection when they read the Bible. They, 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 they consider themselves a Christian, but they don't really know uh, what to do, and they don't really feel like they're doing things right or something, something along that, those lines. And I just messaged that person directly, and... Uh, I, I kind of I feel like I kind of got this from you, but I was like, hey, so I'll go over a few things with you, but the first thing I want to do is, I'm paraphrasing, is pretend the tables are turned, and let, let's pretend I'm the one asking you for advice, and I have one question, what must I do to be saved? And they, they got some of it right, and some of it not, not quite right. They, they said, like, you know, accepting Jesus' sacrifice, uh, as him having paid for your sins, uh, but then also something about you have to have a relationship through prayer and follow the commandments and repent from your sin because he hates your sin. And I was like, okay, like you got a little bit of it, right? A little bit, but not right. Um, but then I answered, I sent Acts 16, 30 through 31 and basically said, you know, simply put, it's all about faith. Uh, that your past, present, and future sins are paid for. And uh, that sincere faith in this is the path of God's gift and everlasting life. And when I explained this to her, her response was, that feels like a weight was lifted off my shoulder. <laughs> nice. And, and, yeah, and it's just like, it's just like, wow, like, maybe I actually have really, like, increased my understanding of this to the point where I can actually effectively help other people now. 
And that's an amazing thing. And I've been talking to my sister and, and talking to her about it. And I don't feel, you know, when I really for the longest time, I mean, even not that long ago, I, I feel like I would get nervous on whether or not I should bring this stuff up to people. And now, I mean, granted, these two of these examples are over the internet, so I don't have any reason to, it's, you know, anonymous there, but just feeling way more comfortable talking to people and feeling like I'm actually providing, like, fruitful conversations to people. Like, that, that is such a blessing to be able to have. And it also reminds me of that verse I sent you the other day. Um, I can't remember. Let me find it real quick. Uh... Thou shalt be God. It's uh, yeah, Luke Luke one seventy six and seventy seven. Thou child shalt be called the prophet of the highest, for thou shalt go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation unto his people by the remission of their sins. I, yeah, Luke Luke one seventy six. I, I just felt like that was so powerful. It was actually um, it was on the verse of the day on here on on Bible Gateway, but whatever day that was, and. Uh, yeah, that, that shall be called prophet of the highest. Like you know, and then it, that goes along with like uh, royal priesthood and all those verses. It's pretty pretty profound to me, and I feel like I'm seeing that in my life. I, I don't know, and maybe it's maybe it's because the end is getting nearer. I, I don't know, but well, it's pretty amazing. Yeah, that is amazing, and uh, you know, it's interesting that when you talk to people. Uh, I think you have a greater influence on people than what you realize because, um, you know, when people know what you believe, they act different around you than they would right. somebody that is, you know, foul-mouthed and, <laughs> you know what I mean? That's true. Somebody that yeah. is, uh, you know, talking about, um, you know, sex or whatever all the time. Um, because there are, there are people a lot of people like that right just um, hatred toward others uh, and they mask it through humor and that sort of thing and then try uh -huh. you know uh, just the attitudes and the character of a lot of people are um, you know not the same right and so when they're around them they act one way and then when they're around you they act another way so and you're not able to see it but i think if you could you know see i guess from god's view that all-knowing view you would see how people act differently now for, for me in my life i i can use my own experiences uh, acting differently around different people and trying to make them happy right and so a lot of people are like that so they'll act one way around you and another way around another person so you're it might not seem to you like you're having any effect on anybody uh, but the truth of the matter is you have a tremendous effect a tremendous positive effect on a whole lot of people there's no doubt there's no doubt about it in my mind um, just talking about these things it's gonna get people to think about you know what it is that they believe and that, that you really can't do anything more than that right so you're you're yeah. preaching the gospel you're planting the seeds and uh, anybody that follows the truth will you know pick up on it and find the truth guaranteed right yeah definitely and all glory to god of course i'm not trying to make it sound like it's you know credit to me for helping people but uh, obviously i want you know god to use me and that's really more what it feels like it just feels like in those moments something has been different and maybe maybe it won't always be like this i don't know maybe sometimes it won't feel so like it comes so naturally more so than other times but it just like in that moment when that person asked for help I just felt like I knew exactly what I needed to say and I don't know I, I'd like to think it helped like, there's no way for me to know so I can't really be too celebratory when I, I really have no idea 
Well, right. If a person saved or not, it's not for me to know, but just just to be able to have the opportunity to share the gospel with somebody uh, is is so great and feels so rewarding. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So um, you consider that they're not going to get that sort of message from just anybody, right? So we really have um, a calling in life, and it's really, I think that's why we are called kings and priests unto God because we are royalty we are a holy priesthood right and um, we're separate we're different than the other people and really we have an example of that in the Old Testament where um, the the nation of God or the what am I looking for the Israel was different than those countries that surrounded them the the people were different and so also is it true that we're different than those other people that are not believers that are not born of God and you know so we're really we you know um, we almost have a duty to uh, be the example for for those for those that aren't saved and not just for those that are like our age and not saved but for children that are growing up in the world to you know get that opportunity to see you know people that um, are different if you will right mm-hmm um, yeah, so I and I think about that sort of stuff, but it, it you know, <laughs> it's like to me if if you don't preach the gospel to whoever, who you know, a certain person, who's gonna preach to them? You know, right? Like a young fella, nineteen, twenty years old. If you don't show them that you have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, who is gonna show? that faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Who's going to be that uh-huh. example for them? You know, and I think everybody needs that kind of example and I think that's why it's important to sort of almost um, you know, uh oh, I don't know what the word is. Um sort of um, uh, you know, just give ourselves in that moment uh sort of uh make ourselves look like fools in that moment for God's sake and for their sake so that they might have an opportunity to witness something that they wouldn't normally witness. Right? That makes sense, yeah. I, I hope. Uh, yeah, I mean, I guess maybe this isn't what you're saying, but I was kind of envisioning just like basically having the having the bravery to come out of your shell and step in and yeah. preach to someone who might not have another opportunity for all you know in their whole lives. You think about how, how few people are like us in the world. That means how rare it could potentially be for a person to encounter a faithful Christian. And, uh, yeah, you know, and so it really is up in it. I, I feel like I've, for most of my time as a Christian, kind of been crushed under the weight of that, and and kind of failed to uh, seize a lot of opportunities. Um, especially, I, I don't know what it is. I don't know what feels like it clicked. I mean, I, I definitely feel like I've always believed since 2016, um, but it just it just feels like something clicked. I just feel so much more confident in what I believe. I think maybe there was just some gray area on the doctrine, and the more I've studied and read and conversations I've had and so forth, the more clear it's become. And, and also just, like, I mean, you really can't beat the dead horse of explaining what the gospel is enough. Like, the, it's like the more you hear it, even if it's just the same few verses, like this one right here, I've read that verse a thousand times, and it's like the... the, the the understanding goes deeper and deeper 
as time goes on, as your faith grows like a tree, you know, it produces more fruit. Even if you think you already understand it as much as you possibly can, it's, uh, it's, it's almost like a cycle of knowledge or something. And it finally just feels like it clicked with me. And I, and it's funny because I still have so much to learn too. That's another thing that was on my mind when I, I think when I messaged you originally asking if you wanted to chat, what would have been yesterday? I was thinking like, you know, despite this confidence that I have, I, I mean, I, there's so much I don't know. So, I, you know, it's up to me to continue learning and studying, and but also be able to spread that that knowledge that I'm blessed to have with other people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, real quickly, uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can hear you. Oh, all right. There so you go. Can you, can you hear me now? Uh, yeah, you're pretty quiet. Your, your mic was fine. Where was that? What's going on? Well, when I clicked on this earlier, I thought it was all the way off. But that doesn't really make sense because... You could still hear me in the beginning, so I don't know. I'm just doing them, <laughs> just checking the mic and wondering. Yeah, no, no, you sound, yeah, you sound good. If, if you turn it up too high, there's like kind of a feedback. Oh, okay, so. Uh, yeah, so it's it's fine right there. Yep. It's okay right here. Yeah, for me it's loud and clear. Yep. Too loud? No, no, okay. it's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it was earlier you were talking about this verse that I put up on the screen, being confident of this very thing that he which has begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Is that the verse that you were? Yeah, when I said th that verse right there, yeah. I was talking about that one, yeah. yeah. And and the, the other night when I was um, talking to that person I was telling you about, uh, when they when they were asking for help in that community I'm in, um, I explained that sort of stuff, and they said it feels like a weight was lifted off my shoulder. I immediately shared that, and also Ephesians 4, verse 30, uh, which is, Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. To me, those two verses kind of go hand in hand, and just further support uh, that once that faith has come, you can rest assured you know, that Jesus' sacrifice pays for your sins in full. And, of course, once saved, always saved. And I, I explained that this is the gospel or good news of Jesus Christ, because it almost sounds too good to be true. You know, but that's that's exactly why it's good news. It, it, there's no amount of burnt offerings that we have to do. Uh, it's already been done for us. Right, and, and the, the fact of the matter is, we all need a Savior. Right. And it's to me. It's interesting. I had a I had a conversation with this gentleman uh, the other day, about a week ago, and he's talking about how the truth is um, what you make it. And um, he was sort of uh, uh, really when he's talking about Christianity and how you know maybe you know the things in the Bible were put there. It to control people, and uh, oh, yeah, I've heard lots of that. Yeah, and all this and that, and uh, and you know he brought up. I don't remember exactly the conversation, but bringing up, um, you know, eating the flesh and drinking the blood, and uh, yeah, he tried to make it out as though you probably heard this, making it out as oh yeah cannibalism, and uh, suggesting that there might be even something to cannibalism and uh essentially the the feeling i got is he's getting all his information for about the catholic church and relating it to being a christian uh -huh. and then he goes into um you know just again uh, the truth is whatever you make it and and i, I tried to i tried my best to say well if I have a truth and you have a truth that's and those truths conflict um, outside of our truths there is a truth that exists there's an absolute absolute yeah, truth an yeah. absolute truth regardless of what me and you think and I, I just don't right. think that reached into his into his head the idea that there's a truth out there 
that is that exist regardless of what we believe i mean we can yeah and i brought this up to him a while back as well we can all believe everybody in the world or on the planet can believe that we're going to grow antennas on our head <laughs> we can all firmly believe it it's not going to happen because it's, right. it's not it's not part of the truth the right so we we can't dictate truth no matter what right. the, majority opinion is we don't dictate truth yeah the truth will stand on its own regardless of it, it doesn't need us to to believe in it for it to be true it just is yeah 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 you know i just wonder how he took that I, sometimes i have a goofy way of explaining stuff um because yeah that's... It, but when you consider what they're preaching essentially <laughs> Yeah, it, it's even there, goofier. There's a lot of different ways to explain it. I mean, what he's saying, the truth is what you make it. That's like saying the truth is subjective. Yeah, meaning it's different for everybody. But what, to your point, absolute truth is objective, right? Like a subject, something subjective is an opinion. It's like we are the subject. And that is our opinion, and it is subjective. But reality is the object. It's it doesn't matter if every single person on Earth died right now earth would still be here or the world would still be here word, word of God would still be here those things are objective they are absolute truths they do not need anybody to to support its existence by believing in it like for example um, the dollar bill right like that that only has value because we give it value we believe that it's worth something but it's just like an agreed upon social construct but the truth is radically different from that no matter what happens, it's still there. The truth is still going to happen. Jesus is still going to return. Even if nobody on earth believed it, it's still going to happen. Yeah. And that's the difference between absolute truth and a subjective opinion. You can't say, these people just don't believe in an absolute truth. <laughs> so for me, it's like, it's hard to get these people to understand that. It's like, well, if you think the truth is whatever subjective and opinion i mean if he says the truth was he make it maybe in his mind it's slightly different than the truth is subjective but to me it's like well if i slapped you in the face right now would that would that still be subjective i mean that's like if i if i if i you know did something objective are you gonna say i didn't just slap you in the face like like it's just because your opinion that makes it true i mean it's like where do you draw the line with this like at some point there is a definitive reality that we are in, that we we're in this like shared world together, and there is there is absolutism to it. I, maybe maybe my explanation isn't good either. There's a lot of different ways I feel like you can explain this. There's a lot of different ways I've tried to explain it to people. Um, in yeah. particular, people who like the the the, the uh, argument that kind of it doesn't bother me, but it's just kind of like a I just almost shake my head at it that people who say, oh, well, I believe in science, you know, instead of, like, you believe in your fairy tale book, I believe in science. Well, unfortunately, science is what brought me to the Bible, <laughs> so maybe you don't see it that way. I was once an atheist. I once said that exact same stuff, that I believe in science. I mean, that is a contradiction. You don't believe in science. That doesn't make any sense. Science is not something that is believed in. Science is, again, objective. It's just there. It is reality. And when I started to look into all the deceptions in the world and started to consider, like, what information can we even trust if everything we know is a lie? That was what, that was what led me to the Bible. And to me, the Bible is objective truth. The Bible is science. I mean, if it's the truth, even if, even if it's something that I can't prove and that I believe in, it's still, it's still the truth. And someday you'll be able to prove it. I mean, there's science that exists today that didn't exist at one point. So what? It wasn't science then, and it is now. Like, what? you know, you know what I'm saying? Like, at some point Jesus will return. That's the truth. Uh, to me, that's as good as science. It's not maybe what the definition of the word science is, but well, what is uh, you know, the definition? You can well, right. So it's it's supposed to be like something in the in the uh, natural physical world that can be observed, and. Uh, and demonstrated through what you know, so something that can be uh, proven through observation and experiment. But uh, to 
me, I mean, for example, uh, with cosmology, with the flat Earth, once I just once I realized and I felt like I could see plain as day that we were not on a spinning ball flying in outer space, I realized that the truth of how we got here must be radically different than coming from monkeys, uh, you know, in outer space. That this doesn't make any sense. It doesn't work. So there has to be a different truth to it. And Genesis explains a perfectly, uh, a perfect, um, it, it aligns with that perfectly. And like you just pointed out, science meaning knowledge. So in that case, yeah, it, it would be science. Yeah, um, yeah. So the Bible is the greatest science book. Science book there is. The yeah, exactly. Yeah. People might think that's silly, but truthfully, I, as this world continues to descend into wickedness um, this is about the only truth that the, the only physical piece of t- truth that we can rely on we, we we can't even trust our own eyes half the time with all the crazy stuff that's going on all yeah. the CGI you know I mean so many people are fooled by smoke and mirrors uh, optical illusions stuff like that that you really need the Word of God as your your truth, your science book, so to speak. Yeah, yeah, no, I agree with that totally. Um, because, um, you know, the physical things that we see, they're, it's going to go away someday. You know, you right. take a look at those, all, like you shared a video of all those beautiful buildings, the swimming pool... And just a beautiful landscape. Well, all that's going to go away one day. Right. And um, so that's, in a sense, it's not real. It's temporary. I mean, it's real, right. but it's it's not going to last it's, it's, forever. Uh, right. Yep. Um, so what we should uh, strive for is those things that endure forever. Right. Um, What is that verse that I'm looking for? Uh, All men are as grass. I thought thought that was in 1 Peter. Oh, I can't think of the verse now. It's driving me crazy. Hold on a second. Hold on a second. What is that verse? Um, Oh, oh, no, 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 no. I got it. Um, I know... I know which one you're talking about, and the one that I pulled up is not the same, but it's kind of along the same. Which one did you pull up? Line of thinking. Uh, James four fourteen. Okay, here it is. That's first, where... first Peter one, very first, very first uh, chapter of Peter. Um, for all flesh is as grass, and the glory of man as the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away, but the word of the Lord endures. Forever, and this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. So I just brought that up just to show that even um, man is as the flower of grass, and even right. man is going to, you know, from the dust we came. And what's that verse in Ecclesiastes? Um, I wish I could remember every single verse in the Bible in a split second, <laughs> right? But yeah. um, we came from the dust. I mean, we can go to Genesis too, uh, also. But uh, we come from the dust, and, and to the dust we'll return. Um, I'll go into one place, and our all, all are of the dust, and all turn to dust again. Yeah. You think? Of, yeah, there it is. Ecclesiastes twelve. Yeah. Uh, then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the spirit shall return unto God. Who gave it? And to me, this is very powerful. It's something I did not understand until I was, you know, t- 25 years old, and or maybe 26 or whatever. But um, I didn't really even understand it then. But it was it was just a new idea that was that came to me in my head, and that is the difference between, um, you know, the physical things and the spirit. Um, you know, it, because like uh well for example i i knew you know i thought spirit i could never understand 
what the spirit was about you know what the spirit but you could see the spirit in people you know as a young man all right and i even wrote a song called the spirit flows but i didn't understand it and then once i read john chapter 3 uh, that which is born of the flesh is flesh and that which is born of the spirit is spirit and then it started to make sense that there is a spirit from above right and that's what jesus means because we're all born of the flesh but we're not all born of the spirit and so there are many spirits in the world today when you look at people and the spirit of people some good and some bad um, but ultimately the spirit of god which is from above is all good and that spirit is love and so also ought we to love one another and that's challenging um, because we're in this flesh right but thank god that this flesh will one day be done away with and will be given a new flesh a flesh that has no sin right that does not have those i guess um dark desires or those sinful desires that we currently have um all because it's the way we're made right it's it's not it's not just the way we're made but that's how god made us and it's because of the curse if you will of adam and eve eating from the uh -huh. knowledge of the eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil all right so because of that uh, we have to endure these things in the flesh but um, thank thanks be to God that we have uh, you know escape out of this uh, wretched flesh uh, wretched uh, flesh that we're in and a promise of a, a better flesh right right a way through death and out the other side to eternal life. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it's interesting. Um, so I, have I shared this with you before about Genesis 1, verse 1? We've definitely talked about it a lot. Okay. Well, I just, I had an opportunity to share this with a young lady the other day, and it she seemed to be interested by it and um, um, so real quick real quickly I want to know if you, I want to share this with you and see if you have any thoughts so when we open up an NIV or whatever Bible version and it says heavens in verse 1 that's wrong right yeah because it says created the heaven and the earth right and, and this is actually this is a lie to say heavens it's just one you know one letter but it turns verse yeah, one it into a line saying, yeah. because in the first the second day God created the firmament and he called the firmament heaven in the evening and the morning were the second day so God didn't create the heavens on the first day. He created heaven and earth on the first day, and then he created the firmament, which he called heaven, the second day. So the heavens were not made until the first two days were complete, essentially, right? So we go to chapter 2 verse 1 hopefully and we see that thus the heavens and the earth were finished right they weren't it wasn't heavens until God completed the work so in verse 1 it's not correct it's not true that um, you know God created the heavens on the first day does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, and so, I mean, why? Why why put heavens 
why use that word heavens? It doesn't make any sense to me. It's wrong, and um, uh, I don't care. <laughs> I don't care what the justification for it. It's just wrong. <laughs> yeah, probably, I don't know. Maybe maybe to make it sound like outer space. I'm not sure. Yeah, no. I think that's exactly it. Yeah, so do you, I wondered if you had any additional thoughts to that. Maybe you don't. I just Not thought, really. I, I think it's interesting how heaven is capitalized in, what is it, verse, uh, was it verse 5? Or is it further down? No, it's verse 8, right? Or am I way off? Yeah, verse 8. That's capitalized there. And then, so I guess, you know, what we look up and see, the firmament called heaven, but then the original heaven and earth. And it's, it's interesting. Uh, I mean, I've always been fascinated with sort of the cosmology aspect of it because I wonder what we see when we look up and this kind of, this kind of, uh, I don't know, seems to pertain a little bit to that when verse 1 says, created the heaven and the earth, and then on the second day created the firmament and called it heaven, and then in Genesis chapter 2 says heaven's. Um, people people often envision heaven as like a spiritual place. Actually, I feel like the common belief is, you know, will I go to heaven? Uh, you know, they, they assume that we spend eternity in heaven. But I mean, if we're getting a new a new body and there's going to be a new heaven and new earth, and we're going to be on the new earth, so I, yeah, I, it seems like that's just maybe a misconception that people I feel like that's how I heard it growing up and I feel like a lot of people probably think of it that way don't really know about the new heaven and new earth and really just what the Bible says in general as people have a completely different idea in their head of what the Bible says most of the time yeah, yeah. So, like, I just want to share you, share something with you. So, here in Jeremiah four twenty twenty five, it says, um, "Birds of the heavens, you were fled." And then, uh, for example, Matthew eight, and the birds of the air have nest. And then, of course, what was the other one? Ecclesiastes ten, for a bird of the air shall carry the voice. So, um, whether it's the bird of the air or bird of the heavens, I think it's the same thing so we think of earth as solid and then we think of air as you know space I guess or air or however you want to describe it um, so to me I mean that's just how I view it um, I don't know if that makes any sense you understand what I'm saying uh, yeah I, I do um... Okay, so let me throw this at you. So in Genesis 1, when God created the heaven and the earth, that is the air and the solid. So by this creation, we naturally have gravity. Okay. Um, so to me... I, honestly, I don't know why people argue about gravity. Because everything is weighted down. Why is everything weighted down to the earth? Everything will fall down to the earth. Well, that's how God made it in the very beginning. Yeah, I mean, it depends on what your definition of gravity is, though. Like, you're, you're basically just saying everything's weighted down it's like there's an up and there's a down yeah and items fall down right and that's how we understand what gravity is but then you could expand and say gravity is uh some kind of uh some kind of math equation that explains what holds all the planets together holds all the planets yeah, together that's that's what that's what a lot of people believe so that's probably why people argue against it because i mean the, the word gravity, if I'm not mistaken, was 
made by uh, Sir Isaac Newton. Uh, um, yeah. when, when was he around? Uh, I don't know. A couple hundred years ago, maybe? I, I'm not sure, honestly. Yeah, so the, the problem... Uh, yeah, the, the, the word gravity is in the Bible, I see here. Yeah, yeah. But I guess it, when I say, I guess, okay, so he didn't invent the word, but the, the quote, law of gravity, I guess that's what I'm referring to. Okay, the philosophy or the, the yeah, the... Right, yeah, right, the right. The theories of gravity. That, the see, theory, that's all yes. nonsense. The theories and philosophies and all, that's all nonsense. And I get it. If right, you get, right. It, when people have a problem with that, I, I'm with them. But what I don't, yeah. what I can't go... But along, you're just calling it, yeah... Right there, weight, heaviness, yeah, density, density. Which, yeah, saying? that's wait, wait, wait. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with that. There's no density there. Density is something uh, completely different. That's that's weight, right? Density. I, yeah. I, density is weight. I guess I don't know English very good. That's how I understand it. I thought density, density well, was how good. hard something was. Because think, because uh, yeah, no. compactness. So that's different. But so you can, you can. I, I've always paired density and buoyancy to explain why things fall or rise. Uh, so, for example, uh, you put like a ball full of air in a pool. It rises because it's buoyant. It's less dense than the water. It's lighter. Then, it's so if we go back to gravity, it's lighter than its surrounding. The the what it what surrounds it is heavier. So the yeah, heavier that's, things. That's just how I've always. Under, I mean, I, I really don't think it matters. It's kind of like an apples and oranges. It's I'm using density pretty much as a synonym for how heavy it is. Yeah, Something's so, denser than the air, no, so it falls. Yeah, so no, that, so the, heavier than the air. That's not. I don't think that's what the word means. The density it has to do with how compact something is. It has nothing to do with weight. But you could argue that the greater density, the heavier it is, because it's look. It's described as a quantity of matter. So this is this is getting down into like. So the philosoph the philosophical science laws. Well, I don't care about the, phil the the philosophy and the theories. I'm just saying that density is has to do with how. But what what's on your screen is the philosophy and theory. That's what I'm saying. That's what you're referring no, to. No, no, no. It says right there. Right there. This compact density of a body indicates the quantity quantity of matter contained in it under a given that, bowl, forget quantity about, of matter. Forget about that. <laughs> forget about it's, that. It's the same thing though. The philosophy, I don't, I'm not, I, I don't care about the philosophy. The definition of the word is that compactness. How, you know, how strong or how sturdy or how stable an object is. Um, it really has no relevance to weight. Now, I, I get it in theory, you could say something more dense is weightier. But it that's not what the word means. The word means how compact or how stable an object is. Anyways, I, I don't care about this sort of stuff. It just to me, I don't understand why. I don't either. Why people um, don't, in fact, teach gravity. It, to me, it doesn't make any sense. In fact, uh, it's what God made in the very first verse. The heaven above and the earth below without that also, distinction there is no heaven and earth so where gravity is in the bible i don't think it's talking about weight oh yeah it is yeah let's see where where do we get this um let's see well it's talking about matters i think let's see i, I don't remember one that rules well his own house having his children in subjection with all 
gravity so um yeah so not it, not in the not in the sense that we're using gravity as in how heavy like an object weighs so so i mean so this would explain why I, th I feel like this is a valid reason and not to take away from the point you're making but this is in my opinion a valid reason not to teach it because let's say we explain essentially heaven is up earth is down things fall because they're heavy they fall down to the earth they're heavier than the air whatever um and then we say gravity and then let's say they go off on their own and they look up gravity and they see uh, some kind of spinning ball planet nonsense it could be confusing even if in reality it just means weight it, that word is now today used for all sorts of nonsense when you could find a different way to explain it without potentially confusing somebody now if you give them the context that it just means weight and that it does not mean the philosophical stuff then yeah there's absolutely nothing wrong with that but in my mind that I feel like it's understandable why someone would just avoid using a word that could, could potentially confuse people and when you look in the Bible it looks like it's talking about you know, in, all, in all things showing thyself a pattern of good works in doctrine showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity um, sound speech that you cannot be condemned so I think in this sense it's saying uh, more, of a, more of a character trait than you know than in the context of something being heavy yeah serious so, here we go seriousness sobriety of manners solemnity yeah. of deportment or char character uh, so yeah yeah so no you're right you're actually right that doesn't actually have anything at all to do with weight does it no um and again i mean not that you can't use it to explain that but um but personally, I get it because, like I said, I I prefer to avoid potentially confusing people. As long as you can provide the context of what gravity actually means in that sense, and that's fine. But it could it could mislead people. I think. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah, and so I I really again I, I think people um, unnecessarily confuse the matter. So, anyways, let's move on to something else. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I don't even remember what. Oh, yeah, this is Genesis one. That's right. Yeah, so I just wanted. To, I, guess I can't remember how we got onto that. Yeah. So I just think it's very interesting. Genesis one, two, and three, and really the whole Bible. But yeah, the yeah, issue. I will say, uh, I didn't realize. Uh, in Genesis 2 verse 1 that it says heavens that is pretty interesting yeah 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 be, and, and uh, there's a difference because um, this firm and then uh, there was somebody I was listening to I think yesterday who uh, oh, I don't remember what he was saying um, he was saying something about the firmament fallen have you ever heard of that so basically he what he says no. is the firmament fell and because the firmament fell people started to age and then when Jesus comes back he'll restore he'll uh, restore the firmament and we won't age anymore now that's to me one of the most ridiculous <laughs> I, was just say, I, don't, I don't know where you'd find something like that yeah yeah and it's not in the Bible anywhere. Um, yeah, how would the firmament fall? I, I thought maybe at first you're going to say something about the flood, maybe like, but cause, yeah, because uh, the firmament was like opened, was it not? Yeah, heaven opened. Yeah, the water not, Now well, you know what I find fascinating about that. I think I've told, talked to you about this before, but have you ever seen the pictures of what they call the Milky Way galaxy? Yeah. You can. I've never. Really, I've seen maybe a little bit, maybe, but I can't really tell if I'm imagining things because everywhere I've been, there's oh, too much light pollution. But if you go, you mean you go with the, the desert, naked eye, right? No, uh, people I... people take pictures, right, of these incredible shots. Uh, but yeah, so it can't be that. It's got to be. I wonder if they got one. Yeah, like that right there. Mm -hmm. Now, 
you could say that's fake. I mean, I've seen so many pictures of this of people just like random nobodies going out to like the desert or wherever and they see this. What are the chances that that is where the firmament was opened, where heaven was opened to to flood the world? I mean, is is that total just nonsense? Do you think? I don't I don't believe this, but I just remember seeing that at some point and wondering if that's what that is. No, no, I don't believe that. Uh, somebody would have to have some pretty hard evidence for that. So, well, yeah, I mean, well, yeah, I don't think there's any way you could prove it. I just, it's just a, kind of a theory <clears throat> that I just kind of was wondering. Because um, it, it does, I mean, I'd have to go out into a place with no light pollution to be able to see that. But um, it begs the question, when the flood happened, how do you think the water got here? Where, where, where did you think it just came in, like, from... Oh, uh, yeah. It says, yeah, windows of heaven were open. So I guess I wonder well, what that looks like. The fountains of the great deep. Deep broken up. Broken up. And so oh, if we can do a map of the earth, and uh, if it's possible, if I had my Google Earth, um, if I could open, maybe I have to open it. Heck, you can't even see nothing anymore. You used to be able to see... <laughs> I mean, you think about this for a second. Uh, you've got, what, 10,000 satellites in space, and we can't get some pictures of the Earth? All we get is these cartoon yeah. drawings? Uh, so anyways, uh, I thought I had Google Earth. Uh, maybe I don't. This is what I want to look at here. I want to see the actual images. And I guess I could open that one. Doggone it, this is kind of stupid here. Let's go. There we go. <laughs> Let's do. I'm gonna have to just do it this way. It, the internet has gotten more complicated in the last ten ten years. It really has. I mean, it used to just be able to do things simple. Now everything's controlled. So anyway, so this will take a minute to load, but I'm gonna show you what I believe is the fountains of the great deep. So let me go back to. Genesis 7 real quickly in the 600th year of Noah's life in the second, second month, month the 17th day um, boy somebody the other day made a pretty interesting point about the 17th day and then the 27th day was when uh, they got out of the ark uh, but anyway so uh, the same day were all the fountains oh no, okay. Well, well, let me share that with you. All right, so the 17th day is when they entered the ark. The 27th day is when they got out of the ark. Uh, good for... It was 40 days, right? Four, 17 and 27 is 44, right? So here, since I'm making the point, let me make, let me prove it. All right, so. Uh, oh yeah, forty days and forty. Oh yeah, forty days and forty nights. Huh. Um, when did they get out? Here, I got to make sure that what I'm giving you is accurate here. All uh, right, so I thought it was the next. I got to think. Is it Genesis eight? When they got out, what day of the month was it? seventh month on the 17th day of the month so I'm not sure I'm not sure what in the world I'm not sure I'm not sure how we got 27 I'm not sure so uh, let me get back to that so maybe I'll have to go to it another another time but it was it's interesting because in the very first chapter of the Bible or I'm sorry what I say the very first verse yes no 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 that's not right is it how many letters are right here uh, off the top of my head I can't remember 5 10 14 17 20 24 27 33 36 39 44 um, yeah. So apparently 
There's 44 letters in the very first verse of the Bible. And in the last. And the very last verse of the Bible. There's, there's 44 letters, right? Mm -hmm. And it's interesting because there's 17 vowels and 27 uh, of the other stuff. What do you call it? Nouns? Cons consonants. Consonants, that's it. Alright, so we got 17 vowels, 27 cons consonants. Here you can count them here. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27. All right, so there's 17 vowels, 27 consonants. You go here to the very first verse, same thing. 27 cotton, uh, content, whatever you call them things. One, yeah. two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three, twenty-four, twenty-five, twenty-six, twenty-seven. 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27. And isn't that interesting? And to me, it's kind of amazing. Yeah. And I didn't really want to get into this, but if you open up your NIV, you're not going to get that same result. Right. Because of that one, <laughs> one yeah. letter. All right, so maybe we can open up Google Earth now. All right, so notice here. Well, first of all, let's pretend this isn't cartoons. All right, let's pretend this is real and believe what we're seeing okay um, I've never been here so I don't know so in Genesis 7 when it talks about the fountains of the great deep were opened as well as the windows of heaven were opened right the fountains of the great deep were broken up and then we see here in between the continents what to me looks like cracks in the ocean floor it's not so clear to see as it used to be there used to be a time when you could see this pretty good so do you see this this crack here yeah so there used to be on this thing on the Google Earth that I had where you could actually see the elevation of the ocean floor. It's not as visible, but you can still see the crack. Right? And you could follow you could follow that crack all around the ocean all around the world on the ocean floor. It's not as it's not as prevalent as it used to be. This has been years since I looked at this stuff. And to me, that's interesting because there's almost like walls, like boundaries here in this part. But you can see this one for sure, um, possibly. And that's what I believe is the is the fountains of the great deep. This crack, this great big crack that runs through the earth. Now, you see what I'm looking at? Yeah, I do. I guess I have to, like, what, how are we, how, I mean, we wouldn't be able to see that if we were up in a plane. How are we, how are we seeing this on the I mean, ocean how floor? How that ocean there? It's got to be. Yeah, I, I guess uh, Google has these magic radar things that they can see stuff. But this has been part of Google for, oh, I guess the Earth is a curve. Wait a second. <laughs> So maybe this this is kind of cool, but I don't want to spend too much time doing this because I'll end up seeing stuff that will blow my mind, and I don't like to do that. But anyway, I just <laughs> wanted to share that with you. Yeah. Well. So, and then the other part, though, I mean, to to finish the verse, and actually, real quick before I say that, um, the verse you're looking for on when Noah leaves dark is Genesis 8 verse 14 that's where it says in the second month on the 20 on the 7 and 20th day of the month oh the thank tried. you I, I shouldn't say what I searched earlier 20 
I don't remember. I, yeah, that's why I searched too. 20th. Yeah, 7 and 20th. Where's this at? That's what... Uh, verse 14. So what I do, I put a Y at the end of 20, and that's why it wouldn't yeah, come just, up. You just put twent in the future. Twent. <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah. So, <laughs> so there it is. Twent. Isn't that interesting? So they enter on the 17th, and they came out on the 27th. And the very first verse of the Bible, there's 17 vowels, 27 consonants. And the very last verse as well. And 14, or excuse me, 44 letters. Yeah, that's, that's crazy. Absolutely amazing. And there's actually the same thing in the very middle of the Bible, too, but I don't remember what verse that was. Did, did I ever, yeah, did I ever tell you I bought uh, that book? I think I did. What was it? Brandon Peterson's book, the 777. Uh, where he goes over all, all sorts of stuff like that in the Bible. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know if you told me or not. It, it's yeah, cool. yeah. I, I got it. I haven't I haven't dug into it real deep yet, but I got it so, uh, after I moved here. Yeah, so I think that all stuff is it's all very interesting. I wouldn't use that to preach to unbelievers. No, no. It's just kind of for your own. Uh, yeah. Yeah, just kind of for your own in, entertainment and uh, fascination, right? So you can get something to nerd over. So I like doing that stuff, so it's pretty cool. But yeah, I agree. Nothing, you know, you're not going to use that uh, to preach to people necessarily. Right. More sh something to share amongst believers. I mean, it is amazing, though, for sure. Um, oh, and then, and then to not to derail, but regarding the great deep, that, oh, you know, I, I don't know where we were at, uh, but the windows of heaven, that's. And, and it, you know, maybe this is something we can only speculate on. But uh, yeah, the windows of heaven were opened. So, I mean, I what does that mean? I, you know, I just think it means uh, it was raining. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I Based don't... on what you said earlier, that's, that's a fair... That is a fair... Uh, because Conclusion. because there or, is moisture yeah. in the air right now, what's preventing it from falling down? Well, right. something in the atmosphere opens up and the water falls down. I don't, I can't explain it. But uh, looks like we got this this phrase window windows of heaven mentioned three times: Genesis seven, Genesis eight, and then in Micah three. So let me read Micah 3. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house, and prove me now where herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven, and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. So that's interesting. I might um, Next time I read that, I'll keep this in mind, that this is only mentioned three times in the Bible. Yeah. And, well, and, and uh, I mean, it, and the Bible does talk about clouds, too, so, I don't know, it's yeah. maybe something we can think about. Right, and so, it's interesting, so there was not rain on the earth until that moment in time, so, what we read about here in uh, the creation, and God said, let there be, no, 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 no wait, what am I looking for here? What's that word that I'm looking for? Um, oh, where I thought it was missed. No, 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 it was missed. Excuse me, not mids, but missed. But there went up a mist from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. So instead of rain, they had a mist that would come up from the earth and water the ground. And so, when this event happened in Genesis 7, when the windows of heaven were open and the fountains of the great deep were broken up, this was all a new experience for everybody on earth, right? Because they had not experienced rain. Like, you know, we've been, we've been getting a lot of rain lately. They never had. They never had rain. I believe that, and that they never had rain until the rain came and the flood washed them all away. Hmm. 
see it. To me, in, uh, that in itself is pretty interesting. So, there's a lot of mentions of the word rain. 13 in the New Testament. Now, I'm wondering, is there something relating to Noah's flood that mentions rain? Uh, rain in the days of Lot rain fire and brimstone I don't think there is no I mean you have to wonder how plants and stuff would survive with no rain yeah it, t it tells you right there in, in Genesis 2 the, a mist came up from the earth so uh, right there again that, that tells us the, that you know the whole world was different right the way things yeah. were was a lot different. But there went up a mist from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. So, I mean, that's, you know, yeah. that's what I think. That's what I think. Because... Yeah, that's interesting. But, I mean, that, that kind of sounds like, I don't, I don't know. It doesn't specify, but I mean, that's kind of like what clouds are in a way, right? It's um, like a mist comes up from the earth. Right. Well, not the clouds. I mean, yeah, the clouds are in the sky, but it, a mist, in my guess, in my mind, is something that comes almost like a, almost like a water that shoots up and falls down I don't know I don't know I to me right no I see what you're saying I'm just saying like I thought you could almost interpret that as I mean because you can I mean well <laughs> you have to get in an airplane to be this high but you could you can be above probably not being an airplane you can go on like a mountain or something you can be above the clouds it's like in your perspective you could almost think that that's what that is just mist coming up and down just a much greater distance well, yeah, but, but it, I mean that's, that's probably not what it's saying. But I'm just you know I'm just right. So the the water will go up, but it won't come down right away. Right. But yeah, no. Also, just uh, again, um, here in verse uh, in Genesis two verse five, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth. Um, yeah. And of course, we don't we don't hear about rain until Genesis seven, or the idea of rain is not mentioned until uh -huh. Genesis seven. So to me, it's it's pretty it's interesting to me. Yeah, definitely, definitely very interesting. Yeah, and then that word mist. How many times is that mentioned? Twelve times. A few times. Well, there's James four fourteen. I was going to bring that up earlier. When we were talking about uh, your life is or that, uh, that we're like grass, uh, or life, you know, our life uh, fades away, so and so forth. Yeah, this actually doesn't mention mist, does it? No, it doesn't. It says uh, well, vapor. vapor. Suggests a result. It's kind of interesting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I can, you kind of watch out for that sometimes, but it is. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, but there went up a mess. Uh, let's see, mistress. That's not the same. Mistress, mistress. Uh, oh, so it's only. Let me do. Yeah. It's one, only once. Three times. One. Two. And immediately there fell on him a mist. In a darkness, all right. and there wells of water, clouds. These are wells without water, clouds that are carried with a tempest. To whom the mist of darkness is reserved forever. All right, so um, it's just interesting. Sometimes I like to uh, look at that sort of stuff. Yeah, definitely. Second Peter, it's a great book too. Oh yeah, definitely, definitely, and. Uh, Again, I talked about this this morning, but you know, I, I don't know, you probably didn't see that I did a video this morning 
about how Lindsay, um, I think it's probably self pronounced, uh, the world's leading expert on Bible prophecy. And he's one of those guys that I got fascinated with when I was first a believer. And, you know, he would he would reel off verses left and right, and he would talk about how evil the Muslims were. And uh, and then I started to notice some, some problems with what he was teaching, and specifically um, his, uh, his teachings on the land, Israel. And, you know, it, it conflicts with what the Bible says. Uh-huh. And... So, you know, I thought, wow, this guy, I, th I once thought he was a great Bible prophecy expert. But then, like, this morning, I, I, you know, I clicked on one of his old videos or whatever, and it showed, it showed him a long time ago in the 80s talking about this idea that Jesus is going to come, and he's going to... There's going to be a, nothing but believers, and there's going to be a thousand years of peace. And uh, I'm sure you've heard me talk about it before. Maybe you've heard other people talk about it, but... Oh, yeah. When, when you read Second Peter chapter 3, the heavens and the earth which are now, by the same word, are kept in store reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. Right, so you're familiar with the passages where Jesus says no man knows the day or the hour. Right. But that's when Jesus comes, he'll come as a thief in the night. And just like when um, the, the fountains of the great deep were broken open and the windows of heaven were opened up and water came down and the whole world was flooded, it took them all by surprise. So also when the Lord Jesus comes, it'll take the whole world by surprise. Right, and Jesus even talks about that himself, right? For in the days of Noah, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the floods came and took them all away. Right? If, I, if I'm remembering that verse correctly. And knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall yep. also the coming of the Son of Man be. I was just looking at that chapter two where it says, uh, I was looking at the parable of the fig tree right above that. Yeah. Um, so, the starting here in 31, or 32, I mean, the, learn the parable of the fig tree when its branch is yet tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer's near. So likewise ye, when you shall see all these things, know that it is near even at the doors when you see all these things right and you telling me we're not seeing um, um well all these things up until verse 29 we're well I, I don't know if I can even say that but all these things that Jesus talks about the deceivers right the wars right. and um, being right. offended and all this sort of stuff um, we ought to know, uh, and specifically, specifically when Jesus is asked, what is the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? The very first thing he says is, take heed, that no, no man understand. deceive you. Yeah. For many shall come in my name, saying that I, Jesus, am Christ, and shall deceive many. So this is really key to the downfall of the world. Uh -huh. So I, to me that's a great sign of the, uh, the world, this world's coming to an end, right? And here in Second Peter 3, the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. It's the same thing as it was in the days of Noah. Right. So shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man. In and to further support, uh, to further support the 
thief in the night right there. Also in, in Matthew 24, right after the parable of the fig tree, it says, uh, uh, Watch therefore, for ye not for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. That's verse 42. And it says right after that, which so it says you, you don't know what hour the Lord comes, which is basically what it's implying with the thief in the night verse. And then it says uh, that, know this, if the good man of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not the Son of Man cometh. It just perfectly uh, mirrors what it says there in Second Peter absolutely absolutely it's the same thing and how these guys that are experts and this to me just reminds me of john 3 okay in john 3 oh yeah absolutely jesus says thou art a master of israel and you don't know this stuff where's this at where's uh Verse 10. Oh, there. Okay. Uh, when he explains it, after he explains that you must be born again. And Jesus said, you're a master of Israel and you don't know these things. And so, to me, Hal Lindsey, being the world's leading expert on Bible prophecy, he doesn't know this. And it's not just him. right? I mean, we, it's unbelievable. Ninety-nine uh, percent of the preachers today preach this idea that Jesus comes is coming, and there will be a thousand years of peace. That's not in the Bible anywhere. And in fact, let me show you all those verses that you shared that you showed me there in Matthew twenty-four. It, to your point, it connect. It's the same thing. We, we connect the dots here in Second Peter three. It's the same thing. Now, if we know it's the same thing, then also we should know. That when Jesus comes, the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, and the earth also, and the works that are therein, shall be burned up. You cannot have a, a, you can't have a new earth, right? And then have another new earth a thousand years later. <laughs> yeah. And because, you know, you, you go to Revelation 20. All right. So after the thousand years, it's the end of the world. And then in Revelation 21, we have a new heaven and a new earth. Right? I mean, it's you can't have... It just doesn't make any sense, man. It's like these people that teach uh, 55 different returns of the Lord. If they would have known, I mean, they should have known. The, the Bible talks about the return of our Lord Jesus Christ uh, over and over and over again, but it's talking about the very same event. Uh, it, you know, <laughs> I mean, I don't. I don't know how, why it's so complicated, why people want to teach this idea of a thousand years of peace that's not mentioned anywhere at all in the Bible. And so here, um, where, what was I looking for here? Um, oh, uh, from whose face the he earth oh, and yeah. heaven fled away. Verse 11, right here. When we compare that to what, what we read in Second Peter 3, the heaven shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, and the earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. That's parallel with whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. All right. we'll, yeah, absolutely. And then again we go to Matthew 24, and we read that the sun shall be dark and the moon shall not give her light, star shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken again this is parallel with the earth and the heaven flooding away and the heaven shall pass away with a great noise and the elements shall melt with fervent heat and this is all parallel seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved right what manner of persons ought we to be in all holy conversation and godliness 
looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens be on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness, not righteousness for a thousand years, not peace for a thousand years, but for all eternity, forever and ever. You know, we're not putting our hope into a brief period of time, a bonus thousand years. That's ridiculous. I, honestly, I don't want nothing to do with that. At all. I don't know why anybody would want that. <laughs> no, no, I don't either. I, I want eternal life. And that's what Jesus yeah. promises us. Whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Now think about this, Gage. This is the point that I wanted to make. So the, the idea that Hal Lindsey and so many others present is that Jesus comes... And sets up his, uh, you know, reigns and rules from uh, the Middle East. All right, and then um, I, apparently it's just going to be believers. That's that's what Hal Lindsey says. So now there's a thousand years where there's just believers on the earth. Okay, now at the end of the thousand years, Satan is loosed. Okay, so keep in mind, there's only believers on the earth. And he goes out to deceive the nations, while the nations have to be believers. And he gathers them together to battle. He gathers the believers together to battle. And then God sends fire down from heaven and devours them. You, you see what I'm seeing? Uh, yeah. So... That, that does not sound like good news to me. No. What are these guys teaching? This is There's no truth in that whatsoever. No. I, I, it's it's mind-boggling. And the and thing is, it's so simple. So just get, bear with me one second here. I'm going to show you three, three verses. So here in Genesis 3, verse 15, the, the prophecy is made. The Lord is saying... To the serpent, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Now, there's a whole lot there that's very interesting, but just uh, uh, for the moment here, pay attention to um, it'll bruise the head of the serpent, and it will bruise the heel of the Savior. That's what this means. All right. Uh -huh. So in something like uh, Psalm 110, for, for example, this is echoed all throughout the Bible. Okay. There are many verses here. And the Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Right. And then I, I've, I'm sure I'm, I've shown you Revelation 3. I could go to 1 Corinthians 15 as well. And maybe I should, but let's go to Revelation 3. And verse 9, it says, Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. So in Revelation 20, when we read about fire coming down from God out of heaven and devouring them, we're up in the air with the Lord. Right? We can't be down on the earth. You, and when, right. you, you, when you read this, you, where's all the saved people? Satan is loose. Do you think he, Satan is loose at the end of the thousand years? Uh, to deceive saved people? That's not what it says. You think God's <laughs> going to send fire down and kill saved people? No, you should have put all this stuff together. Right? And... In Matthew 13, though, really, this to me makes it as simple and easy to understand as anything. That's the parable of the wheat and the tares. Yep. This is, this is the example I've used probably the most. Yeah, so this, the idea of a thousand years of peace it is in total contradiction to the parable of the wheat and the tares. 
Yeah. yeah it's a, it's quite amazing. So, anyway, they're, they're saying he's going to get the the week together, yeah. throw it aside, stare at it for a little while, and then burn it. And then burn, burn the wheat that he just harvested. Uh, that's what he says. Doesn't make any sense. <laughs> it doesn't. None at all. And I think the last time we talked, uh, we talked about Daniel nine and how they they take the the Messiah and they turn him into the Antichrist and they give credit right. to the Antichrist. All right. Well, they 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 do that in other places as well. Uh, yeah. You know, here, you know, here in Revelation twenty, being another example of that. All right. And to me, it's insane. So if you don't mind. Um, you know this uh, in verse 4 and I saw thrones and they that sat yeah. upon them have I talked to you about that oh yeah this is this is the verse 4 is the bread and butter of that, that whole chapter it's, that's where people get the confusion I feel like you might be right yeah um, I just want to make sure that you can see it because it's to me it's uh, it makes it clear as day you know I mean, if you would have read with Revelation 1, we're kings and priests of God right yeah. now. This is, not in a, this is not in the future, right? <laughs> right. This is not, well, when Jesus what? comes, you're gonna, he's going to reign for a thousand years, and you're going to be a king and a priest during that thousand years oh. of peace. No, 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 no. And it says, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, we are, we are washed right now. Yes right now right now so it's a strange religion to teach this idea that you're going to be a king and a priest for a thousand years but you're not right now and you're really admitting that you're not saved right now when you make that claim and uh yeah i mean the world's leading bible expert or prophecy expert or whatever how can you even claim to have even read a single verse in the bible i mean this stuff is so unbelievable <laughs> really in exodus 19 the children of israel are a key they they are a kingdom of priests and a holy nation that should you know that should be obvious right right i don't know yeah, how to miss mean, that understanding the gospel maybe this is just i don't know maybe this is uh not a thought out opinion but i, I kind of feel like understanding the gospel first and then sort of the, the timeline i mean in my head that's that's almost like kind of how i prioritize understanding the bible maybe i shouldn't prioritize it like that but i mean first you want to you got i mean absolutely first you have to know what the gospel is and then at least maybe maybe i should say it this way it seems like that's what's screwed up the most what people argue about the most and what people tend to get wrong the most that are extremely important to understand is a the gospel and b uh what the, what the end of the world is what the prophecy is i mean this is like the whole whole story of what's going to happen this is the end result this is like the climax of the timeline of humanity right here this is the big moment that everyone's waiting for from the time they're born it's, it's this right here and people are getting their own so but there are two very very crucial things that people uh, for whatever reason more often than not seem to get wrong yeah yeah it's it's crazy really um, and I think a large part of it is is people sort of you know we live in I don't know what it is man we live in this time where people don't want to find the truth they just want to click on a video and listen to somebody tell them the truth you know yeah. you spend 13 plus years that's what you're used to doing you don't go to a place to learn for yourself you go to a place to be told what to think uh, mm -hmm. and you spend all that time being brainwashed and controlled and so now we have a whole generation upon generation of people who don't want to read the Bible and learn for themselves they just want to go 
to a church or, or click on a video or turn on the TV and have somebody tell them what God says. You can. Have, and then you got the. Go ahead. I was going to say, and then you have the blind leading the blind. And then you have people who don't know who are coming in ignorant and looking at these people that are the blind leading the blind. And they say, well, that sounds stupid. And then they go to people like me or you and say, well, you're brainwashed. You're being controlled. And really, they have no idea what they're talking about. And everything they've ever heard about what they think we believe is is completely different than what we believe even though it might sound the same on the surface it's because the, the scripture is being completely twisted and you got to think it's got to be in some form or another a, a product of the of the vatican catholic church well there's or no satan you could say yeah 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 i mean th there's no doubt that all roads lead to rome but right. uh, you know ultimately the the problem is the human heart right and uh, so individuals have to take it upon themselves mm -hmm. to learn about God um, and it to me is so apparent so obvious that the world is full of deceptions and the, I mean it's amazing that's exactly what Jesus warns us of and we see it happening more so now than ever before and, and it's crazy because uh, and I see this just with the blind leading the blind thing and people that just have no idea what they're talking about. I see this all the time. People throw these accusations at us where they say, I mean, just look at, I was just looking at these verses you have on your screen, you know, blessed and holy is he, kings and priests and all this. And people say that we're controlled and brainwashed. How are we controlled? I mean, we are, we are as far from controlled. And then these same people are going and talking about, you know, new age hippie nonsense. They're, they're in the, or, or works-based salvation, or whatever it is, they're, these people that are accusing us of being controlled are the ones that believe in some sort of socially engineered, made-up doctrine of devils, and we are the ones that are free. I couldn't possibly conceive of a more free uh, uh, state of being than what we are as, as saved Christians, God's people. You're, I mean, you can... I, I literally could not, with my imagination, think of something more freeing. It's it is the most freeing thing I could possibly think of. It's the complete opposite of being controlled. We we are uncontrolled. We cannot be controlled. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. If the sun will make you free. If the yeah, sun, because yeah, I'm sorry. If the sun therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free, indeed. And uh, what's that? What? Oh, where is it? And here, uh, oh, no, oh, it's not. It's not plucked. It's plucked. You already know what I'm going to say. Uh, John ten, uh, twenty-eight and twenty-nine. My father, which gave them to me, is greater than all, and no man's able to pluck them out of my father's hand. Uh, nobody can take it away from us. I mean, they could come to our house with a SWAT team and tie us up and beat us to death until we admit that Jesus is not God, and we're not going to give that to him because we know that the truth, no matter what they do to us, they can't take that away from us. Even when we pass on from this world, uh, we still have that. It's, it's the, it is literally the most freeing possible thing you could ever possibly have yeah and it's not from a single thing that you did right <laughs> yeah exactly it's so <laughs> it's so amazing it's so amazing so, which just it just further supports that you are not controlled this isn't i don't have to sit here and atone and be a good boy or i lose my salvation it doesn't work like that but again this is why i feel like people have these misconceptions and so they think wrongly of what we believe, and they just don't understand it. No, of course we're not being controlled by fear. We're 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 liberated. Right. If they did understand it, they'd be like us. But of course, they don't understand. Right. It. Um. What well, you know? What is it's kind of I got some stuff I got to do, but it's been a great talk. Um, yeah, uh, we. It's been probably a couple hours. I think we talked for a while here yeah 
Yeah. I just, I just didn't want to interrupt it. We were talking about so many good things. but No, yeah, I think, um, you know, if you wanted, we could do this once a week, and maybe we wouldn't talk for so long every time we talk. <laughs> you know what I mean? We're getting like three yeah. weeks worth of stuff in here in one one night. So. Right, right. Yeah, we could, I, I know, and stuff comes up. I know last last time I think we were going to do it, some stuff would come up. But, uh, but yeah, I, I would like to try to have a more scheduled routine 